Hello and a warm welcome to the virtual Flash Memory Summit, November 2020. My name is Jack Gage. I am the CEO of NewMem, a provider of smart memory IP cores based on MRAM. Today, I want to talk about the MRAM-based DNN accelerator for the high-performance space computing program. As we know, there is and continues to be an acceleration of data, data being captured, data being transmitted, forecast that to be in the 175 zettabytes by 2025. Those are numbers that even us memory expert cannot grasp as they're so large. And uh, to give an idea, a zettabyte is the entire Library of Congress, 70 million times. So 175 zettabytes represents no less than 12 million 500 times the entire Library of Congress. As such, the model, which is very convenient and very efficient to pipe all the data up to the cloud and then do all the processing there as a unified process is no longer practical. Why? It just takes a very large amount of bandwidth. And if you imagine here a space application, that's the asset test. Data is being collected by sensors or an autonomous rover which may have north of 20 cameras collecting a huge amount of data, transmitting to the spacecraft or the space station, and then transmitting back to Earth to the servers where it can be accessed by multiple locations here. Tons of bandwidth in this model, traditional model being piped to the cloud, very slow data transfer, impairing data and analytics in deep space. That communication from the spacecraft to Earth may take over 20 minutes. It creates delayed action and decision. God forbid you would be on a spacewalk in a difficult spot needing to get some analytics being done and you have to wait there for 20 minutes until you get a response. Uh, definitely not practical. Security is also an issue as more and more data is piped bidirectionally, it is more prone to um, cyber attacks or you know, uh, uh, security attacks. So like most systems, and especially for NASA, distributed processing is the way to go. We're now at the sensor or the rover, whatever equipment, intelligence would be built in and then more intelligence would be built in the spacecraft uh, with the capability of compliance instead of intermittent connection or no connection, enabling to have those faster data analytics could mean saving lives or saving very expensive space equipment. Better power efficiency, better security, not only due to the transmission, but also the fact that with intelligence, you can fight cyber attacks more efficiently. And then scalability. Now you can add sensors without bogging down the entire system. So it is very relevant and uh, clearly the acid test of the uh, requirement for distributed system. 
So let's take a look at the requirements of this uh, DNN accelerator program for NASA. In general, NASA is looking for high performance under the size, weight, and power constraints of space missions. They call it SWAP. And their goal is to reduce that and shrink that, that SWAP. Data retention is important for power loss or any kind of environmental instabilities. High endurance, being a space application and also a wide temperature range. Radiation tolerance, and the ability to do the autonomous data analysis so that they can be a faster response time and adaptive learning right at the uh, spacecraft or even the intelligence sensor uh, side. Security, more and more, obviously, cyber threats are increasing. And with more data and analytics, the ability to understand what's going on and take some actions right there at the uh, spacecraft. So some of those applications, we talked about intelligence sensors, uh, the self-driving rover, uh, definitely um, a, a unit which is somewhat comparable to self-driving cars, albeit with a different environment. There's obviously not as many rovers on, on the moon or Mars than there is cars uh, here. So slightly different requirements, but the same need for capturing and processing a lot of data. Deep space with or without human. All kinds of monitoring wearables for astronauts, and we talked about cybersecurity. So let's look at those requirements in terms of uh, the project, this uh, MRAM-based DNN accelerator. And what does MRAM, MRAM's role to achieve those goals? One, in terms of power, MRAM provides lower power solutions. They are much lower standby power in excess of 20x lower standby power. And they're also smaller. Now, smaller means for AI processing, usually not shrinking of the device, but the ability to put more memory on chip more memory on chip means less back and forth to the DRAM, which is roughly 57x more power in, than an internal uh, memory processing. So overall, MRAM enables capability to lower power both inside the chip and by reducing the data transfer back and forth to an external DRAM. It is non volatile. So if power goes off or there's any kind of intermittent, intermittent power failures, the data will be retained, the code will be retained, the coefficients will be retained. So it's quite efficient um, to avoid data loss, but also recover very quickly from a power loss. MRAM is relatively high insurance. Uh, we at NUMEM have tested in excess of 10 to the 9, but some tests we've seen up to 10 to the 12. So we, we fully expect that over time, it will be in the 10 to the 12 or north of 10 to the 12 range. And it is it does very well in terms of uh, temperature, uh, does relatively well and is capable of the wide temperature range from minus 40 to 125C. <clears throat> In terms of radiation tolerance, uh, we at UMEM have done some work. We still have more to do, uh, but essentially uh, we've looked at, uh, at TID and uh, we followed the MIL standards. We've tested multiple devices 
and in uh, each of the groups we've tested for statistical uh, demonstration. And uh, we've basically read irradiated devices with gradually lower voltage. So we could kind of force uh, and determine failure points. And then we tried a bunch of erase, read, write, read uh, on irradiated chips so we could observe if there were any failures. And uh, we're happy to report that we have seen no failure in those preliminary tests. As I said, there's a lot more that we need to do over time. And if we look in general, uh, tests have been done, multiple um, studies have been done on MRAM, and MRAM behaves being a non-transistor base memory behaves a lot better than SRAM or eFlash overall, and it varies. You know, you can see for TID, uh, total ionizing dose, it does um, uh, actually the worst case is embedded flash, uh, whereas for single event, SRAM is the worst case. But in both cases, usually MRAM uh, does does quite well. So this is one of the interest of space application programs using uh, using MRAM because of its inherently higher radiation tolerance. So let's look at the MRAM scalable solution for DNN accelerator that NUMEM is proposing. It is based on a scale, scalable DNN accelerator developed by a NUMEM partner using what they call RPP, which is a reprogrammable processor. That solution can scale from one to 32 processing elements, each processing elements having 32 ALUs for a total per chip of 1024 ALUs, enabling very efficient processing of things like matrix multiplication convolution. For higher performance, those chips can be daisy chains. So for example, um, using four chips, 128 tops could be achieved. The memory architecture is based on MRAM. And uh, we'll see it in the diagram on the next slide. But basically, in order to take advantage of S MRAM and where it fits the best, the memory architecture is split between a high-speed video streaming based on SRAM and a lower power, smaller area footprint memory for weight coefficient based on NURAM. Between those two, because the MRAM is functioning at a, especially on the right, at a different speed, there is a flow control to adjust the flow of data between the rest of the system and the, and the MRAM uh, memory. So if we look at that on a, on a diagram here, you can see that the memory is split between the high-speed data stream, SRAM, and the coefficient memory. So here we're representing that the coefficient memory relatively shrinking, but as a, and by a factor of say two and a half to three and a half X, but actually, what most of our customers are doing uh, in those kind of application is use the space, the same space available to put more memory on chip. So that the DDR access, which is shown on the left side, is reduced. And in one of the application, we've seen reduction of DDR access from 32 gigabytes per second down to 0.7 gigabytes per second. And that saves a tremendous amount of power, uh, as I mentioned earlier, since DDR access about 57 
times higher than internal memory. The flow control enables to regulate the uh, traffic of data uh, going into the, the MRAM. And the MRAM is usually pretty fast on the read. So on the read times, especially by using the customization that we provide, we can go into uh, large word sizes and uh, ability to use parallel banking or pipelining. And so on the read side, usually uh, we can pretty much be at speed into the processing element. Uh, and this is one thing we've noticed, even though those are coefficient and the write is actually nicely for MRAM, um, relatively slow, the read needs to be fairly high performance to be able to get all the coefficient into the network uh, very rapidly. And so that is all processed by the, uh, the processing engines, uh, which as I said, is scalable from one to 32. The benefit is not only the reduction in power by going out to the, by reducing the DRAM access, but also the memory itself is much lower power. So we're talking about 20x, a large amount of that memory is actually idle. And uh, on standby, we're talking about less than 20x. If you take a mode equivalent to the SRAM in retention mode versus AMRAM, then you could be talking about uh, a 50x reduction in, uh, in power. And, you know, as I as discussed earlier, it has the benefit also of this radiation hardness, which is obviously critical for NASA and space application. Now let's take a look at the software for this uh, DNN accelerator. For any AI chip solution, obviously the software is paramount to being able to tap on the performance provided by the accelerator. And so there is no good AI chip solution without a strong software framework. In this case, this solution is leveraging CUDA compatible software. So the CUDA compiler, as well as all the CUDA library, making it easy for users to program the device. It also has a graph compiler, so it can automatically does, do the performance optimization and take advantage of the hardware and memory on the chip. In addition to that, it can cover multiple AI frameworks like the uh, TensorFlow and provide DNN libraries, OpenCV, as well as the ability to simulate at the ISA level for faster simulation. Representative neural networks for this space application include functions for sensor fusion, drain mapping, navigation, and guidance with algorithms like MSGNet, MSNet, VGG16, YOLO, and ORB-SLAM. So also representative is ResNet. And we look here at uh, how it behaves using an RPP8, so using eight processor engine versus NVIDIA TX2 and Xavier. We're looking at it both in terms of a high performance mode and a high, um, a low power, uh, high efficiency mode. In the high performance mode, the RPP8 solution runs about 2x the number of images per second and roughly the same actually, even a little bit more on the low power mode. So we can see here on the upper right running at 
over 2,000 images per second versus uh, somewhere around 800 images per second for Xavier. In terms of power efficiency, it tracks pretty much the same with um, about 50 images per watt per second using Xavier and close to 100 images per watt per second using RPP8 in the high performance mode. And then we can see uh, part of the graph here uh, is actually uh, showing higher advantages at the lower power as we've seen above. So overall, the MRAM DNN accelerator proposed by UMAM provides a scalable solution in conjunction with the new MEM partner to address a wide range of applications from low power to high performance spacecraft applications. It comes with a comprehensive software suite for ease of programming and tapping on the capabilities of the hardware. It provides a path forward to this shrinking size, weight, and power under space constraints, which is a target and focus of NASA. It enables data retention, which is of high importance for intermittent communications or potential power failures, high endurance, and capability of, for a wide temperature range so that both spacecrafts and the sensors can have more and more autonomy and be able to make decisions on the fly as opposed to waiting for the back and forth between Earth and space. The radiation tolerance is promising and the testing that's been done by NUMEM as well as other companies provide a very positive outlook for radiation tolerance due to the fact that MRAM is a non-transistor based storage element. More work needs to be done in that area and, uh, and will be done over time. Finally, MRAM is significantly smaller in size and lower power than SRAM when used in the appropriate applications, like we've demonstrated here with a partitioning of the memory using SRAM for high-speed streaming data and MRAM for weight coefficient. All of this is now supported by multiple foundries all of them have put significant efforts over multiple years to bring MRAM process to production and um, available now in production at uh, different process nodes. And we can see over time the amount of process nodes expanding already in development and expect it to be in production in the near future. With this, we'd love to take your questions, either real time or via chat or online. And uh, feel free to reach us with any questions you might have in the future. And uh, if we can be of any help in uh, helping you develop solutions that similarly will provide capability for space applications as well as commercial applications. Thank you very much.